We are overjoyed to be joined by Michelle Coughlin. Please help me in welcoming Michelle. J. Michelle Coughlin is senior lecturer in American literature at the University of Manchester, UK, where she teaches courses on US radical memory, food studies, and the literary life of the senses. She is the author of Sensational Internationalism, The Paris Commune, and the Remapping of American Memory in the Long 19th Century, which was awarded the 2017 Arthur Miller Center First Book Prize in American Studies, and she recently edited the Cambridge Companion to Literature and Food. So without further ado, I'm going to share my screen with Michelle's presentation and I will kick it off to you. Okay, great, thank you. Before I get started, I wanted to say what a pleasure it is to be speaking to all of you this evening, though I can't see your faces, but I am I'm grateful to Lena for letting me know that you are there. Um, and also to thank Lena and Ariel for organizing this event, which um, as you've already heard, coincides uh, with the 150th anniversary of the Paris Commune uprising, um, which you know initially gets marked on the 18th of March, but um, lasted, uh, the uprising lasted uh, until the final weeks of May. Um, in my talk tonight, I wanna take up some of the ways that the commune found a new life in New York, um, and in turn, some of the inspiration and the energy that radical New Yorkers drew from their many returns to it. Um, my book on this topic largely focuses on the commune's afterlives in late 19th and early 20th century America, by way of boys' adventure fiction and periodical poems, sensational media coverage, pyrotechnic spectacles, radical pamphlets, highbrow novels by writers like Henry James, but also radical pulp fiction like um, werewolf novels by Guy Endor. Um, but before I take us back uh, to the 19th century and the early 20th century, I wanted to start with the communes resurfacing um, during a much more recent past. In the fall of 2012, investigative theater troupe The Civilians debuted its production of Paris Commune, which sought to tell the story of the world-changing 72-day-long 1871 uprising as a 19-minute musical at the Arts Emerson Theater in Boston and the Brooklyn Academy of Music. Drawing on memoirs, found text, and translations of original music from the time, including Jean-Baptiste Clément's The Temps des Cerises, or The Time of Cherries, the production did not shy away from relating the commune's devastating end, but focused its energies on channeling, as New York Times theater critic Ben Brantley put it, quote, some of the exhilaration, liberation, and exhaustion known by the Parisians who took over their city in the heady spring of 1871. That headiness and hope had taken on a new urgency in the aftermath of the events of the previous year. As composer and co-author Michael Friedman explained in an interview on the eve of the production's arrival at BAM, quote, the current, current political situation is almost amazing. And going through the material from the Paris Commune through the lens of Occupy, through the lens of the Arab Spring is almost uncanny. Reviewers of the musical similarly underscored the way the historical production explicitly sought to return us to our own 21st century political moment as much as to 1871. Where the Boston Globe Review drew attention to the particularly pointed question posed, poised, sorry, posed by one of the show's narrators, namely, imagine it happening today, the liberation of the poor, the New York Times titled its review, Occupying Paris with Revolutionary Zest, amplified by the Can-Can. But while the occupations of Zuccotti Park and Tower Square had made the commune feel newly resonant, as Christian Ross argues in her powerful recent book, Communal Luxury, quote, there are moments when a particular event or struggle enters vividly into the figurability of the present. And this seems to me to be the case with the commune today. The civilian's deeply timely resurrection of the commune relied on the premise, also made explicit by its narrators, that while this history now mattered more and differently, it hadn't mattered much or at all to Americans previous generations. As I argue in my book, this truism resonates with claims often made about American historical memory, namely that as a nation, we are prone to blithely forgetting the past, but it also couldn't be further from the truth, at least when it comes to the commune. The assumption that the commune had very little purchase for Americans until Occupy made it new, brings into sharp relief, as I take up in sensational internationalism, how much we've forgotten about how radically transatlantic the experience of the commune was, 
how much of a sensation it made in its own moment. Um, taking, for example, historian Samuel Bernstein noting that, quote, no political or economic issue in the United States, save governmental corruption, received more headlines in the American press of the 1870s than did the Paris Commune. And most of all, how often and to what cross purposes the commune was fashioned anew over and again in US memory decades before the occupations of 2011. Now it must be said that the story of the commune in New York isn't once a national one, part of a much larger story about radical memory in the United States, and also from the start an anti-national one, part of US radicals commitment to internationalism and at times very explicitly non-national modes of living and remembering in their search for alternatives to capitalism as they then knew and lived it. In the spring of 1902, some three decades after the communist suppression, socialist organizer N.L. Grease made what might now seem like a highly unexpected assertion to a crowd of union members in Los Angeles. Quote, other men may have their days, but to the American working man, the anniversary of the Paris Commune will be the greatest celebration in the calendar. Yet throughout the final decades of the 19th and well into the 20th century, thousands of Americans gathered each March to mark the birth of the commune with elaborate festivals involving rousing speeches, moving tableau vivant, music and dancing. This annual cycle of celebration rather than commemoration brought together a wide spectrum of US radicals, among them influential postbellum activists such as Victoria Woodhull and Wendell Phillips, social gospel proponents such as George Heron, socialists like Daniel de Leon, anarchists like Benjamin Tucker and Lucy Parsons, wobblies like Big Bill Haywood and Eugene B. Debs, and labor organizers like B.G. Haskell and W.C. Owen. Perhaps even more remarkably, it did so in cities across the country, from New York to Providence, St. Paul to Detroit, and Denver to Los Angeles. These commune festivities, as well as the essays and editorials that preceded and sometimes encapsulated them, also appeared in the full gamut of postbellum leftist print culture, uniting readers of Woodhull and Claflin's Weekly, The Arbeiter Zeitung, Liberty, The People, Appeal to Reason, Mother Earth, The Blast, as well as numerous other immigrant papers. And though radical print and performance culture is often studied in isolation, these anniversary celebrations elicited equally substantial coverage in a variety of local and major metropolitan daily newspapers in the 1870s and well into the turn of the century, both in the sense of the announcements now otherwise buried in the local miscellany section of papers such as the St. Louis Globe Democrat, the Rocky Mountain News, the Indianapolis Journal, and the Milwaukee Daily Sentinel, but also in the detailed reportage from cel celebration halls featured in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, and the Chicago Daily Interocean, which were in turn telegraphed across the country and reprinted in a number of uh, smaller papers, for example, the Poughkeepsie Daily Eagle, the Kansas Atchison Champion, the Raleigh News and Observer, the Philadelphia North American, and the Galveston Daily News. But if the vitriolic coverage these celebrations elicited in mainstream US periodicals, time and again centered on their multinational invocation of the commune as quote, universal republic. It centered as well on the deeply international, even extranational character of these radical festivities, which explicitly figured themselves as standing in place of national holidays, traditional institutions of national affiliation, and most of all, nation-based memory culture. And though mainstream US newspapers often expressed alarm at the range of nationalities represented as speakers and attendees at these gatherings, as the Philadelphia North American would put it of a March 1884 commune festival held in New York City, quote, only mischief of the worst kind could bring French, Germans, and Russians into fraternity. And in this case, the mischief is the criminal combination against the best interest of society. Anglo-American participation in such pointedly anti-national events drew no less ire. For gathering each year to jubilantly mark the commune's birth, rather than to commemorate its defeat 70 
odd days later, allowed late 19th and early 20th century radicals to live by and through a radical calendar whose sense of alternate time and subversive affiliation provided the grounds for extra national feeling as a kind of embodied practice of radical memory making. So this was internationalism that was at once about temporality, but also a kind of sensation. But there's also a particularly local part to the story of the commune's afterlives in America, of which New York played a particularly important part. Well, Geneva and London became the central hubs for it. So I'm seeing that the, there's difficulty hearing me. I'm speaking as loud as I possibly can and the um, volume is up as high as it possibly can. So I don't know, <laughs> I'm not sure in terms of whether there's, a, um, whether it's a Wi-Fi issue uh, on my end or not. Just wanted to, to unmute to say that um, I can hear you just fine. Um, and, uh, and I hope everyone else can, um, thank you. Okay. People are saying that they can hear you. Okay. Thank you. Go on. <laughs> so I'll say one of the strange things about this talk is since I can only see the image and I can't actually see any of your faces, I can't, you know, it, it's hard to judge whether or not, um, uh, you know, how, whether you can hear me or not. So I appreciate you letting me know. Um, and if there are technical difficulties, please do let Lena know and she can and she can stop me. So I'm gonna take this from the top. But there's also a particularly local part to the story of the commune's afterlives in America of which New York played a particularly important part. While Geneva and London became the central hubs for commune art exiles in Europe. Um, and the backstory to that is that a number of commune art um, exiles and refugees were fleeing the summary executions of the French government bloody reconquering of Paris that took place in the final week of May 1871, what comes to be known as the Bloody Week, which left an estimated 20,000 communards dead. Um, so they're fleeing that violence and they're fleeing the ongoing trials and reprisals and the forced exile um, to the South Pacific that was happening back in France. So most of the um, communard exiles, largely because they couldn't afford to travel very far, end up in Geneva and London. Um, but some do head to New York, which had already offered a safe haven to German and French radicals in the aftermath of the failed revolutions of 1848. And we don't know the precise number of communard exiles who made their way to the city. Of the 5,780 French people who legally immigrated to the United States in 1871, historian Philip M. Katz estimates only a few hundred would have identified as communards. Most of them, he, has, he uh, suggests, congregated in and around New York City. Two of the most famous um, of these being editor, orator, and future anarchist, Edmund Meger, who helped to found um, the Society uh, of uh, Communard Refugees in 1873. And he made his home in New York for over a decade. Um, and Eugène Potier, author of the International, who moved to Patterson, uh, New Jersey. Kristen Ross's wonderful book, Communal, which I'm gonna mention again, because it's so wonderful. I want all of you to go out and read it. Um, but her wonderful book, Communal Luxury, The Political Imaginary of the Paris Commune, takes up in great detail the way that communard refugees in England and Switzerland, um, people such as Alizé Reclu and Andrew André Léo and Paul Lafarge, um, met and collaborated with Marx and Kropotkin and William Morris. And in doing so, they crucially shaped the development of socialist and anarchist thought um, in this moment. And she describes these collaborations and confluences, not so much as quote, the memory of the event or its legacy, although some form of these are already in the making, she says, but rather she calls it its prolongation, every bit as vital to the commune's logic as the initial acts of insurrection in the streets of the city. Henry James's 1886 novel, The Princess Casamassima, also takes up this radical scene and radical intersections um, by way of the communard exile Eustache Poupin in London. So it really thinks about the way that he interacts with anarchists um, and socialists who are meeting um, in pubs and uh, underground taverns in London. 
I personally have come across fewer traces in literature of the communards time in New York, so I would love to hear about them if you have encountered them. Um, but we can find traces of their impact and intersections on New York's radical scene and radical thought um, by way of writings of particularly activists, radical activists um, who were based in New York in this period. So for example, labor union organizer and founder of the American Federation of Labor, um, Samuel Gompers would remark of New York in the 1870s that quote, it was vividly cosmopolitan with depths in its life that few understood. And he hailed it quote, as a haven for refugees and soldiers from all the successive revolutionary movements in Europe. And he really saw that um, as being crucial to the kind of fermentation that was happening in the city around um, labor organizing. Anarchist orator, publisher, and activist Emma Goldman, who we'll talk about in greater detail later, um, who requires no introduction, I'm sure, um, to this company, but who I will nevertheless recall was once dubbed, quote, the most dangerous anarchist in America by none other than J. Edgar Hoover, similarly reflected in her 1931 memoir, Living My Life, on the revolutionaries who called New York home and who met to discuss ideas, to plot future revolution, and, and always to raise a glass at Eustace Schwab's basement beer hall at 50 East First Street, um, which I'll say as a side note, um, has a historical plaque um, precisely because of the work that um, Lena and Ariel's organization is doing. Um, but Goldman writes um, about that uh, beer hall, quote, on Saturdays when I did not have to lecture, we used to visit the saloon of Eustace Schwab, the most famous radical center in New York. The rear room of his little place on First Street was a mecca for French communards, Spanish and Italian refugees, Russian politicals, and German socialists and anarchists who had escaped the Iron Heel of Bismarck. Everyone gathered at Eustace's. This is still Gold, Goldman. Eustace, as we affectionately called him, was the comrade, advisor, and friend of all. The circle was interspersed with many Americans, among them writers and artists, John Swinton, Ambrose Bierce, James Hunker, and other literati loved to listen to Eustace's golden voice, drink his delicious beer and wine, and argue world problems far into the night. Together with Ed, I became a regular frequenter, she says. Um, and we also have um, from New York labor leader and suffragist Leonora O'Reilly, um, who, who helped to found the New York Trade Union League in 1903, um, who writes um, in reflecting on how she came to her life of activism, that it was very much influenced by um, the group around Mege and basically commune survivors that she had met as a child. Um, but radical New York embraced the commune in even more immediate and material ways. While the mainstream US media, politicians, and ministers across the US condemned the communards and sanctioned their bloody suppression, even the mass killing of women and children accused of participating in the uprising, summary executions, which were um, unlike anything that had been covered in, in sort of modern warfare or modern, um, especially press coverage that included illustrations, um, the US press was absolutely sanctioning all of that. And in the face of that, New York radicals, particularly those associated with the First International, immediately began raising funds to support communard refugees in Europe. They also worked to support those that came to New York, but they did an exceptional job um, raising funds for those in Europe. Um, also free willing socialist publisher and free love supporter Victoria Woodhull published sympathetic dispatches on the commune in Woodhull and Claflin's Weekly and printed the whole of Marx's analysis of the commune uprising, the civil war in France for her readers. She and New York City's newly splintered International Working Men's Association also organized in December 1871, a solidarity march aimed at once at honoring the fallen commune and protesting the trial and execution of communard General Rossell some six months after the commune's end. And here I'm gonna say, Selena, thank you so much for doing the images. Um, do you mind bringing up the next slide? Thank you. 
Um, so here we have an illustration of that march, but this march is notable, not just because it has been described as among the largest in the city's history to that point and made headlines across the country, but equally so because the march was a landmark moment of cross racial and cross national working class collab collaboration. The marchers included the African American Skidmore Guard, who you can see in this illustration, suffragists holding red banners calling for quote, complete political and social Social equality for both sexes, communard refugees, Irish nationalists, members of the Garibaldi Guard, Cuban and Venezuelan revolutionaries, various societies and unions, and the Association Internationale de Travailleurs, among others, joined together in the cause of remembering the quote martyrs of the Universal Republic. And you can see a bit of that banner, I believe, in the um, snippet that I've given you of the illustration. Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper suggested the memorial procession attracted, quote, an unusually large crowd of spectators by its estimation, and it was highly critical of this event, by its estimation, nearly 6,000 people assembled in Union Square um, for this procession and remarked in particular on the fact that, quote, all nationalities and colors were represented among the marchers. While Kansas's Lawrence Daily Journal took note of the banner held by one of the marchers that shockingly proclaimed, quote, the world is our country to do good our religion. While many US newspapers took aim at the brazen internationalist bent of the parade expressing concern, often in hyperbolic terms, over, quote, an association of foreign and American communists in New York, styling themselves internationals and setting forth principles akin to, if not identical with, those of the Paris communists who succeeded in making themselves both notorious and infamous by a public parade on the Lord's Day, and I should say they held this on Sunday. This coverage from the, uh, sorry, and that coverage was from the Vermont Chronicle, Labor activist and founder of the Women's top Topographical Union, Augusta Lewis, described the scene instead as, quote, the most genuine democratic affair that was ever witnessed. The inclusive spirit and defiant internationalism of the Memorial Parade of 1871 continued to animate the commune's annual anniversary festivals celebrated in New York throughout the postbellum era. As an advertisement for the ninth anniversary grand festival concert banquet and ball suggests, and here I'm going to say thank you to Lena for uh, switching it over. Um, the event was held at Germania Hall, a working class German American assembly room in the heart of the Bowery's Little Germany, but was sponsored by a broad assortment of radical groups. Um, the Socialistic Labor Party, the Free Thinkers, the Women's Socialistic Society, the Socialistic Leidertafel, the Arbeiter uh, Leidertafel, and um, the Société des Refugiés de la Commune. The multinational constellation of the events, um, which is made clear by the various groups that were um, hosting this, was also telegraphed um, very strongly by the poster's lengthy enumeration of the event's roster of speakers. Now I know that um, it's probably so small that you can't actually see all of these names. Um, so I'm gonna list some of them for you, but on the uh, very lengthy roster of speakers, we have the honorary president of this event, which was exiled communal Louise Michel, who was now a prisoner um, at New Caledonia. We have the vice presidents, including leading American labor journalist John Swinton, um, communard refugee Edmond Mege, um, as well as German anarchist and, of course, famous uh, saloon owner Eustace Schwab, um, Italian labor leader uh, Giuseppe Chaversa, um, and Spanish radical Antonio Gonzalez. But if the red flag prominently displayed on the poster specifically summoned images of the commune, and it certainly was meant to. Um, and the Vive la Commune emblazoned across it further underscored that this event was embracing this very radical ensign. The framing of the celebration made it at once about then and now, suggesting the festivities were not simply a call to remember 1871, but rather to quote, strike for the universal commune. 
The redness of the flag in turn presaged the subversive embrace of red at these festivals, a color scheme so provocative that it consistently merited mention in mainstream newspaper accounts of these events. So the New York Times coverage of the 1884 celebration at Germania Hall notes, for example, that quote, over a thousand people had met to celebrate the 13th anniversary of the Paris Commune. And it fretted that the entire hall and the audience were bedecked in the commune's color of choice. Quote, flaming programs, deep scarlet entrance tickets, boutonnieres of red and mortel and ribbon worn by nearly all present and an unlimited number of flags. Children wore red sashes, red dresses, red hats and men adorned themselves with satin neckties of the approved roseate hue. If the hall and the attendees thus telegraph their embrace of the red flag and their countercultural memory of the commune, the stirring speeches in French, German, and English further cemented the point. In turn, the music and the dancing that followed these addressed uh, the addresses served as a continuation of, rather than a kind of digression from, the program at hand, as they signaled communal celebration rather than some form of elegiac commemoration, a radical jubilance which consistently served to generate consternation in the reports from the hall that were sent by wire across the country. And the message of these events can perhaps best be summed up by labor leader Edward King, whose address at the 1884 festival um, celebrated in New York called on Americans to quote, imitate the Paris Commune, vindicate the memory of the gallant communists and commemorate the anniversary of the great social revolution. And here I think it's worth remarking that if these annual commune celebrations in New York and elsewhere serve to keep the uprising in cyclical circulation, and they certainly did, they just as importantly flew in the face of wider condemnations of the uprising in mainstream US culture. As historian Tom Goyens points out, quote, since the events of 1871 in Paris were reviled by respectable society, a commune festival was truly a subversive statement, something the anarchists in particular exploited by marking it with excessive imagery. In turn, these subversive celebrations <coughs> played a key role in keeping radical periodicals in circulation. So much as the Arbeiter Zeitung, the anarchist newspaper edited by future Haymarket martyr August Spies, launched itself as a daily paper in Chicago in 1879, precisely through funding that it raised by a massive commune festival. Emma Goldman's Mother Earth often linked the magazine's own birthday festivities to its annual commune celebration, promising readers the event would offer, and here I'm gonna say thank you to Lena again for uh, sending us the next one, um, would offer the by then requisite recipe of festivities of speeches and dancing. So here from this advertisement, we see um, even in 1912, um, the fact that this uh, is an event, um, the commune is an event that keeps getting um, celebrated with balls and speeches. Um, the liveliness of this birthday party linking the start of both the commune uprising and Goldman's magazine speaks back to the larger message that late 19th and early 20th century US radicals posited about the event they so insistently met to commemorate each year. And that was, they insisted that it was anything but dead. So in the brief time I have remaining tonight, I wanna to share just a little bit more about how Emma Goldman in particular drew on and returned to the commune and her activism and her writings. Goldman's participation in this annual culture of radical memory is well documented, both in terms of the many speeches that she gave at commune celebrations and the many essays on the commune, which she solicited and published each March in the pages of Mother Earth, the tremendously successful anarchist monthly magazine, which she founded in 1906 and published for over a decade. Take, for example, her parting letter as publisher and editor of Mother Earth Bulletin, penned in April 1918, nine months after she had been consigned to the Missouri State Penitentiary for sedition and a year and a half before she would be forcibly deported from the United States. In it, Goldman duly reflected on the incessant grind of her daily work in prison and the grim conditions experienced by her fellow prisoners. Yet she closed her letter and by extension her magazine 
on a note of typically steely resolve. But I am fortunate in having the babushkas, the Louise Michels, and the other great ones to draw from. This is the month of the commune. They said it was dead when they slaughtered 30,000, but it lives forever. Goldman's suggestion 47 years after it's a sensible defeat that the commune was anything but dead in the early 20th century US, reiterated her insistence at a commune celebration in Milwaukee a decade earlier, that quote, the spirit of the commune is now in existence stronger than ever, a sentiment which would be similarly echoed in the many commune festivals that she organized and the editorials that she authored. But I wanna pause for a moment over the particular vehicle by which she resurrects it here for her readers, invoking its ongoing life through the annual cycle of radical remembrance, reminding readers that March is the month of the commune, um, but personifying its ongoing existence through one particular communard, Louise Michel, a figure by then 13 years dead. Even in passing, Michel flashes up here as a central touchstone and a vital reserve on which Goldman sustains herself and her activism at this, the seeming nadir of her public life in America. But Goldman's curious move to singularize and pluralize her at once. Michelle is set off as the sole inspirational figure to which Goldman affixes a name, while she is rendered also one Louise Michelle among many, works to emphasize the commune's unfinished presence and Michelle's continuing, even contagious influence beyond France. Goldman returned to the topic of the commune and Michelle's influence in her memoirs, Living My Life, where she suggested that her own radicalization had in part grown out of Johann Most's encouragement to read about the life of Louise Michelle, to read about the commune. And it also emerges um, where Goldman devotes several pages to outlining a mini, or what I wanna call a mini biography um, of Michelle's long life of activism the way she had quote again and again courted death and survived the savagery of the respectable Parisian mob, the heroism that she had showed at her trial quickly followed by the devotion and solidarity she demonstrated during her exile, her long exile in New Caledonia, the demonstrations that she leads in France after she receives her, um, there's an amnesty, I, sh I should step back and say, there's an amnesty in 1880, which allowed communards who had been forced into, um, forced exile in the South Pacific to return. Um, and she, uh, Goldman reflects on the fact that as soon as Michelle returns to France, she immediately takes up organizing um, for, well, for social revolution. And finally, her forced immigration to London. Goldman's resurrection of Louise Michel as a central figure of revolution even decades after her death and her evocations of the commune similarly um, vital role in late 19th and early 20th century US radical memory culture were drafted in the final years of the 1920s and published in 1931, a moment when the commune was once again newly resonant for US radicals in New York and elsewhere. On March 15th, 1925, and I apologize here for not having an image of this, um, but we're just gonna have to um, imagine it from what I can tell you about it. But on March 15th, 1925, the Workers' Party of America, together with the Young Communist League, staged a lavish celebration at Madden Madison Square Garden to commemorate the 54th anniversary of the Paris Commune. The Boston Globe estimated that some 13,000 people attended the event, while the New York Times noted that, quote, from the cover of the program to the draperies of the platform, women's blouses and men's boutonnieres, the color scheme in the historic garden was red. The festivities were opened by Julia Stewart Points, longtime labor advocate and founding member of the Communist Party of the United States, who quipped the quote, we are now going to overthrow the United States government, so be prepared for the worst, presumably said for the benefit of the many policemen waiting in the wings to disband the gala. But the highlight of the evening was Alexander Arkhatov's The Paris Commune, a pageant that represented various scenes from the 1871 uprising and featured a cast of several hundred. Two days later, the Times acidly observed the dancing that followed, quote, apparently the proletariat of New York City has not been reduced to the hapless condition where it is incapable of response to the appeal of a good jazz band. But as the dancing and the size of the cast helped to highlight, 
Arkhatov's work of theater production aimed both to retell the story of the commune and to find a new theatrical mode for doing so, incorporating humor, jazz, and outside scale into its revolutionary repertoire. And the spectacle was hailed by the Daily Worker as, quote, the first time in the history of the revolutionary movement that a fitting memorial has been arranged for the Paris Commune. But even as the Commune was being memorialized at Madison Square Garden in 1925, it was also consciously imagined to be quite tangibly living again. The crowd's cries of long live the Commune merged with long live the Soviet republics, as Mosai Elgin, a founding member of the Workers' Party, assured them that, quote, the new Commune stands firm as a rock. And certainly in the aftermath of the Russian Revolution um, of 1917, which loudly proclaimed itself to be the direct successor of the Parisian uprising of 1871, the Commune's revolutionary legacy was newly energized through ongoing coverage in left-wing US periodicals like the Daily Worker and the Labor Defender and the New Masses, even as its history was increasingly revisited through John Reed Club sponsored, sponsored pamphlets, such as Paris on the Barricades, as well as in nearly commemorative pageants and worker theater plays held across the country. But even as the crowd at Madison Square Garden and elsewhere commemorated 1871, they were remembering its legacy and its limitations with a blend of retrospective revolutionary memory and amnesia. For the evening's mix of pageantry and dancing, capitalized on the spectacular role that the commune had for many decades played in American radical culture while simultaneously supplanting, or rather forgetting precisely that earlier and in the case of Goldman that actually overlapping radical tradition. As Paris on the Barricades would put it, the commune's memory mattered more than ever to Americans. Quote, now after 11 years of Soviet rule, the Paris commune is more alive and more meaningful to the working class than it was 15 years ago. Goldman's return to the commune in Living My Life, much like the mini biography of Louise Michel she offers readers ostensibly there only to read her own life story, thus jostled against both mainstream US accounts of the commune as a kind of lurid media sensation and this radical forgetting. At once archiving the ways that the commune had already found new life in America and bristling against the which she thought of as the ossification of its memory by the CPUSA, Goldman underscores both the commune's longstanding international reach and the necessity of reading the life of turn of the century radicalism, even turn of the century New York radicalism, as very much a story without borders. Thank you. Oh, that was really wonderful. Thank you. Um, I'm just getting out of the screen share and uh, now um, just opening up the Q and A. Uh, and let's let's see. Thanks again, Michelle. That was that was really wonderful. Um, oh yes. Um, so Mara is asking about um, Louise Michelle. Um, so um, she's wondering if you could speak a little bit more about about Michelle and um, her role in the Paris Commune. Sure. So. Um... Louise Michel was a um, school teacher by training, um, and that led her to get very interested in um, alternative models of education and really to rebel against the um, Catholic Church's hold over education in France. And so she sort of, she ends up moving to Paris and getting involved in radical circles in the years, let's say the five, 10 years before the commune um, emerges. And when the insurrection um, begins, she um, helps to organize women um, to uh, actually get involved in um, both the political clubs that were arguing um, about what what the commune should actually do, but also she was um, going onto the barricades and carrying a rifle and very much fighting. Um, she ends up surviving uh, the um, very brutal end of the commune. She escapes a summary execution. She's put on trial um, for her participation in the commune. And she very much calls upon the, um, what she sees as a kind of butchers of the French government to go ahead and shoot her. 
um, in the ways that they've killed so many other women that were participating and also that they had killed so many of her comrades um, in a way because she's so eloquent. And also I think because she was a woman when they actually put her on trial, it became more difficult to execute her. They decide to exile her. So they send her off for 10 years to the South Pacific where she is with a number of um, French uh, communards who are in exile, but she also is, um, they've also exiled a number of Algerian um, uh, insurgents as well. And she gets very interested in um, their plight and sort of arguing for, um, I mean, she's kind of an early anti-colonial um, figure in that sense. Um, she ends up uh, coming back after the amnesty, immediately getting involved again in French politics. She organizes marches for the poor. She uh, gets very involved in anarchism. Um, she basically, the French government doesn't know what to do with her because she's so, um, she's such a powerful orator and she's also so, um, I mean, I could spend another hour on her, but basically she just, she had such uh, a strong character and was so virtuous in a certain sense um, that they basically decided that they had to say that she was mad and try to institutionalize her because putting her in jail would not be enough. They did put her in jail. And so she ends up having to flee to London where she gets involved with um, the socialist and anarchist um, movement um, here. And she doesn't actually make it to the US, but a number of women radicals, so Valtrine Declare and Emma Goldman and Lucy Parsons, a number of them go to London because that's where one goes to give speeches and there were many other socialists and anarchists that were there, but they all sort of meet with Louise Michel. Um, and um, anyway, so she ends up really inspiring them and they really want to tell her story. So a number of them, um, Goldman obviously wanted her readers to know about Michel. Um, but Faltrain Declare um, in the final uh, part of her life is trying to write a, a biography um, of Michelle. And unfortunately, a biography of Michelle doesn't end up in English until 1980, but that's a different story. And that biography, could you tell us the name of that biography in case people want to learn more? I'm, I'm going, that sounds so fun. <laughs> I, I, I want to say it's the Red Virgin, but I'm, I'm maybe getting that wrong. Um, I think you're right. I can, I'll send some links after the talk and I can, I can look around. Okay, I can send, I promise I will, I will dig it up and I will send it to you. <laughs> I think you're right, it's the, it's the Red Virgin, yeah. Um, go, sorry, go on. I'm sorry if I interrupted your answer. No, no, no. Okay, um, so let's see, let's see. Um, oh, so um, Randolph has a question. Hi, Randolph. Uh, the operations of the first international were removed to New were moved to New York after the Congress of the Hague in 1872. What, if any, impact did the first international um, have upon this this relocation? Um, so there was definitely, uh, or at least there's conjecture that the confluence of uh, the communard tour in New York and also the um, you know, it's it. There's a splintering that's happening, obviously, within within New York International, but um, between the sort of more German speaking and the English speaking, and also the more working class and the more um, uh, bourgeois radicals, and we could get in it. But but essentially, there's a sense that um, the um, people like Victoria Woodhull and others who are getting involved in um, organizing on behalf of uh, the communards who are in Europe, um, that they are getting energized and there's a sense that the movement is um, growing and there's much more interest that's happening. And so New York, and I think certainly there's a sense that um, the confluence of the communard refugees and the confluence of the interest in the commune and sort of the energy that it was providing sort of becomes grounds for um, the move to having it in New York. Great, thank you. Um, so Catherine wants to know, uh, or Catherine is telling us that um, Chelsea, the, the neighborhood of Chelsea in New York, um, had at one point a, a large French population. Um, and she's wondering if there were any, there was any involvement uh, taking place in Chelsea having to do with the Paris Commune. 
Okay, so that is a really fascinating question. And I'm going to turn it over to all of you to say I would love, I would really love to find out um, if anyone um, pursues us, um, what you learn. I mean, as I kind of said at the outset, I mean, my book was very much trying to think about um, uh, American cultural memory and the commune. And so I wasn't focused specifically on New York, but um, the wonderful thing about Lena asking me to think about this was that it got me to think more about New York and also got me to reflect when I was looking back on the book about how much, how many of the people who were in the book were actually in New York or how much of what I was looking at was often happening in New York and getting relayed in newspapers elsewhere. Um, so this is a long way of saying it means that I don't have um, a strong sense of sort of neighborhood by neighborhood what was going on in New York, but I think that there's much that could be done there. So I, again, would be really interested to find out uh, if anyone picks up. <laughs> Thank you. Anything. So Lena, let me know. Sure. Yeah. I just wanted to offer that there's a wonderful blog that I consulted for my, my blog post, which I wrote for our organization um, uh, called Ephemeral New York um, that I, I will uh, there's a wonderful um, post on there about the Courrier Francais that I will, um, that I'll send to everyone. Yeah, wonderful. Um, I just wanted to encourage people to keep sending in their questions, but also just to say that we are on the way to wrapping it up. Uh, but I had a, I had a question actually, um, Michelle, um, just because our, our organization, the histories we talk about are so much about um, sense of place and uh, kind of about um, what it means for people to be in neighborhoods together um, yeah. through neighborhood or community-based organizations. Um, and I'm wondering if you could just kind of illuminate that, whether it be in regards to the commune itself in Paris or kind of how those ideas about neighborly kind of association were um, taken up. So, I mean, you could probably say something <laughs> to this point in terms of uh, the French side of things, and I would love to hear what you have to say. I mean, it was certainly the case that the working class neighborhoods in Paris that get that sort of become the stronghold of where the political clubs are during the commune and certainly where the um, sort of the initial insurrection happens. Like they have very, very strong senses of themselves as neighborhoods and they have less of a sense of their, well, I think that they felt somewhat, um, you know, distanced from Paris in certain senses because there had been a lot of, um, a lot of the recent, and I'm talking in the 19th century, um, a lot of the recent work to remake the city had been very much the austenization of Paris had been aimed at creating these grand boulevards and all these other things, but essentially both to make it more difficult to have uprisings, but also to make it a city for rich people. And that in fact, uh, a lot of the people who were in these more working class neighborhoods, they were feeling like they were getting pushed out of Paris. And so this was the way they both could reclaim their Parisian identity, but also they felt very strongly about their neighborhoods. I think that, um, I think that the, certainly some of the radicals that come up in the talk tonight, they, uh, they felt very strongly that they were New Yorkers, but they also very, very, very much like the village, like, you know, I think for Emma Goldman saying, for example, used to Schwab's um, saloon was the center of radical New York. Like, I do feel like that there was a sense that that neighborhood, like that, that there, um, but I, one of the things that um, uh, I find really interesting about this moment is there's both, uh, it's both a moment where there are these kind of the, the French quarter that's very self-identified, you know, and a little Germany and all of that, but also how much within these radical circles, like how much interactions there were, because I think um, it, certainly some, there's much less work done on radical uh, history and memory than should be done. Um, but when it happens, it often starts to center on particular, let's say ethnic groups. And while there's a lot of value in that, it can leave out the ways that they were actually really interacting. And that's, so I think thinking about as a neighborhood helps to bring that story together. That's such a wonderful, that's a wonderful answer. Yeah, I think you, you really tied that in really well. Um, and, you know, we are getting some more questions, but I, I think I want to say that, that that seems like a really good, good place to wrap it up. 
um, and a really good ending point. Um, so unless you have anything else to share, Michelle. I will just say thank you. I I'm, I'm appreciate you wrapping it up now, not because I don't enjoy the questions because I really do, but only because it, it's nearly midnight here and my children will let me at five. So, so I appreciate, but, um, but thank you everyone uh, who came and thank you again to Lena and Ariel for organizing. And I would love to see the links and I'll, I'll um, go to my notes again to see whether it is the red version and I'll send that on to you. <laughs> thank you. And thanks again for, for signing, signing in at such a strange time of day and, um, and you know, making it making it my work. Pleasure. We, we really, no, no, really totally my pleasure. Really, really, totally my pleasure. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming, and have a great rest of your of your night. Take care.